Welcome to the Australian Institute of International Affairs. My name is Zenia Anderson and with us today is Mr Nicolas Tenzer, a senior French civil servant and the founding president of the Centre for Study and Research for Political Decision. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, my pleasure. European states are under a lot of pressure at the moment, what with the recent terror attacks in Paris and the massive influx of Syrian refugees. How do you see these issues affecting European unity in the future? Well, I think that the real problem, you know, is that, of course, all those issues are affecting the European unity, but the problem with Europe is a very long-standing issue. And the main problem, in my view, is that there is no geopolitical, I would say, prospect or vision for Europe, actually. Europe was creating, as you know, just to bring peace to the people. It was something like that represents a sort of hope after two world wars. But the idea of the founding father was that peace could only be brought through more economic unity and also through economic growth and a common understanding of basic principles of the liberal economy. And then, of course, Europe was a great success, was able to enlarge, was able also to reassert democratic values. But then came the crisis, especially the crisis of the Eurozone, uh, especially in the, in the, in the, in the years 2007, 2008, etc. And then I think that the European leaders lack the awareness of that geopolitics really matter. And then they were surprised when those geopolitical crises occur. You mentioned the refugee crisis, but we could also talk, and I think that even more important for the European unity, we could talk about the Ukrainian crisis. Mm -hmm. And crisis is probably not the right word. The Ukrainian war brought by Russia to Europe. So, you know, I think that my, my, main, my main, I will say, concern about Europe is the unity of its leaders that must be able to shape and to create the design for the European people of what really Europe means in the world. And the problem is that there were two conflicting ideas driving Europe to its future. The first idea was the idea of human rights, was the sort of the idea of uh, universal values, why the, the idea of the perpetual peace brought by Kant. Mm. And these ideas mean that Europe can, of course, enlarge indefinitely, even to, I don't know, not Australia? European countries, <laughs> probably not. But you know, if we consider, for instance, the US, the US is basically, and especially New York, not the US you know, as a country, but some some cities in New York, in, in, in the US, like New York, for instance, they are basically European cities. If we consider some cities in Canada, they are basically European cities. And of course, the ideas of universal values were at the very core of Europe. Then there is another idea, which is completely conflicting with the, with the former one, which is the idea that Europe must be a power, must be more assertive, just in order not only to be economically powerful, but also to be a real, trustable player in the world stage. As far, for instance, as peace talks are concerned, as far as the discussion about war is concerned. And this idea, conflicting with the first one, was not really reappropriated by most of the European leaders. And the other problem is that the European leaders, we can of course witness it with the refugee crisis, but also with the Ukrainian war, don't have, I will say, common stances mm -hmm. on many of the security issues. Then, of course, there are many other issues we could discuss. And one of them, I think, is very important, which is the relationship between Europe and the rest of the, of the world, and especially there are two main issues. This is the dia dialogue with uh, the US, what we call the transatlantic links, that we have, of course, to reassert, but also to reassess. There are, of course, discrepancies. There are divergent views. 
but basically we are shaming the common ideas. But the problem is that there is actually no true channel to discuss with the U.S. There is, of course, the official channels between, of course, the, 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 the leaders, between the chancelleries, etc. And you have, of course, a lot of meeting between the think tanks from one side of the Atlantic and, uh, and, and, and uh, with one side of the Atlantic with the others that we have. But we don't have, I would think, permanent talks just to put in the table the real issues at stake, and as, as you say in the U.S., to compare the notes. Uh, that's, I think, one of the main issues we have also to discuss. Mm -hmm. And then the second problem is, of course, the discussion that we must have with, the, with, with Asia. There is no common views on Asia, neither from a geopolitical point of view nor from uh, an economic point of view. Mm. And that's also some the, of the issues that Europe must be, to ta must be able to tackle. On Asia, um, the rise of Asia has been a very prominent policy issue for Australia of late. How do you think uh, Europe should respond to Asia's continued rise? Well, I think there are two different uh, sort of uh, two different kinds of of, 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 uh, of answers. Uh, the, the first answer, I think, is I will say mostly I would say a domestic answer for European countries, is that we have, of course, to be even more competitive, more innovative, and that we have we must be able, of course, to support and uh, the, the, the 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 economic growth in Europe and in a way to confront peace, peacefully, of course, with the Asian economies. Mm. We just don't have any other choice than to be able to, um, to, 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 to boost, I would say, our capacities of uh, innovation uh, in the European countries. And that's a huge challenge. Uh, otherwise, uh, you know, uh, the decline of Europe uh, will be uh, continuous in the years to come. And th that's, of course, one of the issues we have to really to tackle. Then, of course, the other problem is uh, the problem of the geopolitical relation or geostrategical relation with Asia. And then the problem is that there is absolutely no Asia. No, I mean that Asia is basically completely diverse. Mm. Uh, when it comes to China, which is a real, I would say, a, a major of course, challenge for, uh, for, for all the world, mm. uh, including for Australia and for the US and for Canada and for others, uh, then of course there is the problem uh, that we have to tackle of uh, what we call uh, China stretch. And we have obviously to reassess, and that's not an easy task, of course, what are the real, I will say, what is the real China's, China's strategy, you know, in the years to come? Uh, just just uh, does China want to become only a regional power with uh, uh, free access to grow material sources and to energy sources, etc.? And then, of course, to secure, you know, all the country around, surrounding it, mm. uh, which is uh, quite an issue. Or is China uh, yearning to be a sort of world power competing with the U.S. as the first not only economic power but also geopolitical mm. power in the world stage? And of course, there are a lot of there are a lot of different views about you know this assessment. And that we have, of course, to discuss. But when it comes to the other countries, then we have, of course, to discuss bilaterally with most of them. We have, of course, discourse with Asian, and there are some dialogue, of course, with Asian country, and we have a lot of forums uh, of discussion also regarding the strategy, regarding warfare, etc. that we have. But then, of course, we have to just to envision the, the each country, the one after the other, and to be probably more engaged. And that's why, for instance, you, I know that, you know, in, in, for instance, if we consider the, the, the French diplomatic service, we are trying to put uh, a greater emphasis to our bilateral relations with most of the Asian countries. I mean, to we are trying to, to, to make the, the embassies uh, bigger, to have also economic services more important and more, I will say, competitive in a way. Uh, and I think that's one of the major challenges that we have. But 
Of course, regarding you know the, the forces that we have, and especially the military forces that we have actually in Europe, including in France, but also in Germany and the UK, uh, of course, we cannot, of course, bring to Asian country a sort of, uh, I would say, strategic umbrella. Mm. That's just impossible. That's just impossible because we, we and we, you, if you consider, for instance, um, up to what point French, France is engaged, you know, in world affairs and in uh, security and peace missions, uh, you know, all, quite all its forces are completely engaged actually in the Middle East, mm. which is, of course, uh, just a three or four hours flight from, uh, from, uh, from Europe, mm. or even two hours if we consider the, 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 the source part of Europe. So we have to be engaged in Africa, we have to be engaged in the Middle East, we have to be engaged also in Sub-Saharan Africa because there are real threats and terrorist threats, you know, in uh, Niger, in Mali, uh, and in all uh, those countries. Mm. Uh, but I think that we must be more involved in political dialogue and also we must be more involved in the discussion with the U.S. And I think that the U.S has also to accept that the European countries, and I think especially the major European countries, I mean, uh, of course, France, but also the UK, and up to a point, because it's a different situation, uh, Germany, uh, and even Poland, of course, could be, I will say, fair partners in this dialogue with the Asian countries. And what do you see the primary challenges being for Europe in the lead up to 2030? Well, there are many different challenges. The first challenge, of course, is, I think, the questions of, I will say, uh, the rise of Euroscepticism and the rise of far-right and sometimes mm -hmm. radical left parties in most of the European countries, France included, but also, as you know, in Hungary, in Finland, in Sweden, in the Netherlands, etc and of course in the UK with the risk of Brexit that we are witnessing now. Uh, and I think that's one of the main challenges is that we must offer to the European citizen a new hope through Europe. And we have to define a sort of strategic vision of what Europe shall be in the next coming years. But if we hear, you know, the European leaders, I mean the leaders of, the, of most of the European countries, we are not hearing one single speech offering a vision of Europe. And I think that's a real concern for us. So that's the first, I think, issue. Then, of course, the second issue is, of course, an economic issue. And the economic issue is, of course, very important because if we are witnessing in the years to come the rise of unemployment, social distress, uh, and also a huge part of Europe just going down uh, with a very worrying impoverishment of huge parts of the population. And that's the case in many parts of Europe, mm. if we compare to Australia, for instance. Then, of course, it will be very difficult to say to the people that Europe represents a hope. But just imagine that if Europe, Europe wouldn't have existed, the situation in Europe actually would be obviously worse. Mm. What Europe brought to the European people is something wonderful, just a wonderful asset that we have. I mean, that I mean when I mention we, I mean we European leaders, uh, think tankers, uh, uh, scholars, uh, politicians. Uh, we have always to say to the European people that Europe brought a lot to the society. Then the third, of course, challenge is, I think, what I must call the Russia's threat, mm. which is something which is real, actually. Just because, as you know, Russia is trying just to dismantle Europe by founding the far-right groups, the Eurosceptics, etc., in all the European countries, and is launching a very big, very thought, propaganda, going in depth, trying just to undermining the European values. And I think that from this point of view, the strategic threat and the reassertiveness of human rights, of liberal values, must go together. Mm. 
And I think also, if we consider all the speeches, all the discourses, all the, 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 the declaration of the, human, uh, of the European leaders, we don't see a lot of, uh, uh, of, uh, of, of, uh, of discourses, uh, statements, uh, giving, I think, uh, this uh, very important place to liberal values, uh, human rights, mm -hmm. etc. And we have, of course, uh, also from a domestic point of view, to reaffirm always that Europe is all about European va uh, basic European values, wha which are liberal values. And we have to say that again, again, and again. And that we cannot accept that powers who are not sharing those values, like Russia, but from another point of view, like China, uh, take the lead on the European mindset. Mm. And I think that's the fourth threat. And then there is also, uh, I think, uh, the third threat. And then there is a fourth threat, I think, uh, which is all, I will say, about the capacity of enlargement. Uh, most of the European people say, well, we must stop to enlarge. Because, of course, the two or three last enlargements were not probably as successful as we are expected. Uh, because, uh, you know, there are, of course, uh, if we consider especially the enlargement of uh, 2004, Many European countries just see the refugee crisis and their stances, you know, about the refugees. Mm -hmm. They really don't share, mm -hmm. which are actually our basic values. And there are also the real problem of justice. There is a real problem of rule of law. There is a real problem of corruption in many of those countries. Just take Romania, just take Bulgaria, even more. And that's true. But if we are stopping actually the enlargement, I mean, the enlargement to the Balkan states like, I don't know, Serbia, uh, like uh, Montenegro, uh, like uh, Macedonia, then it will be a very bad signal. And those countries could probably look to other system of values. Mm -hmm. But having said that, I am not, of course, underestimating the difficulties of the further enlargement. And there is one of the main enlargement which is at stake. There are two main, main enlargement, I think, um, who are at stake, which are at stake at really, which is the enlargement to Ukraine. And I think that we will be, we must be able to enlarge Europe to Ukraine, especially because Maidan, Maidan revolution was all about European values, liberal values. Mm -hmm. And with those Ukrainians, and many of them died for that, who support the Maidan event, they were really, I would say, they, they, they were really, I would say, um, spokespersons, in a way, for Europe. Mm -hmm. And we must answer their claims and their yearnings and their expectations. And I think that's very important. But no, and having said that, I measure all difficulties. I know Ukraine quite well. I went there many, I think, a dozen of times. And I measure, you know, how deep the corruption is in this country, and that there is a real problem of rule of law, etc. Not, not uh, talking about, you know, of course, the, the re-engineering of the economy. And then the problem is Turkey. Uh, I must say that there is a great problem with Turkey. First of all, because we opened the discussion to enlarge with Turkey in 1963. Then, in the Copenhagen summit in 1996, we reaffirm that Turkey, if it means what we call the, criter the Copenhagen criterions, would have the right to join the EU. And then after, most of the European leaders say, well, just it's not possible, we can wait, uh, Turkey probably not an European country, because some people say, Turkey is basically a Muslim country, or because there's a real problem for rule of law in Turkey. That's true. There are real problems, actually, and especially with Erdogan and the second, of course, the second, uh, of course, uh, mandate of Erdogan. There are true problems, and we cannot, of course, say that actually 
Turkey will be welcomed in Europe with uh, the policies that we are witnessing now, with Erdogan, you know, arresting journalists, uh, with uh, breaking, you know, uh, the, the human rights. Uh, that's certainly not possible. But saying that Turkey has not, I will say, a sort of vocation to enter Europe, I think, is probably completely wrong. Then that is, I think, one of the part of the discussion that we must have, actually. And uh, probably we have also to, to understand that with the institutions like they are now, we cannot, of course, enlarge easily anymore. We have probably to change a little bit the rules of the game, because especially when it comes to Turkey or even to Ukraine, because of the uh, demographic uh, weight of those countries that could probably create some turmoil and imbalances uh, within Europe. Mm. And what direction do you see the EU-Australia relationship taking before 2030? Well, I, I, I think that, f first of all, I think that, of course, Australia is a country which basically shares the European values, shares the liberal values, and, of course, um, in a way, Australia was, was of the pioneer country uh, for advocating human rights, for instance. And I think it's quite important to remember that. Uh, we know also that there are a lot of European peoples working, living in Australia and becoming Australian. So I think that there is really, we share, we have a lot of common. We have, I think, the basic, basically we have, a, I think, the same values. We are, we are, the, the, we, 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 we are, the, the, we, we are, mm, we are living in the same world. So I think that's something that we have, must, 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 must have, that you must have in mind. Uh, the other thing is that uh, I think Australia could offer a better understanding of the uh, Asian countries. Mm. And I think that's a good starting point uh, if we envision to do more with Asian countries, and we must understand them, I think, better than we are doing now. Uh, we can, of course, uh, I think, uh, welcome uh, the support of Australia. Uh, and I think that Australia could be, of course, also support for the European countries who want to better understand Australia and do more with those, I don't know, not talking only on mainly about business, but also to, to be more engaged in dialogues, in security dialogues, foreign policy dialogue with Australian country. Then I think that there are actually a lot of talks, bilateral talks already, mm. uh, between some European countries, including France, but also Germany, not mentioning the UK, which of course is uh, a special relation with the UK, obviously. Uh, but and there are this sort of dialogue with Australia. But I think that we can do more. We can do more through exchanges of view, through informal cooperation between the academic centres, universities, think tanks, uh, and I think that would be great. Uh, and probably we have also we European to better understand. That's why also we are trying and my, my own uh, think tank will uh, uh, dedicate one special issue of its review, Le Banquet, to Australia because we also want, I think we, we, hand, we, we must better understand this country. And we must also probably um, do more, I will say, in common, especially in shaping the future for Asia. And I think it would be very interesting, for instance, to have some, I will say, common reports on the future of Asia uh, towards uh, 2030 or 3035. Uh, and I think that could be a very good thing to, to, to just to start this work in common. Thank you so much for joining us today, Mr. Tenza. My pleasure. Thank you. Thanks to you. For more information and analysis, go to internationalaffairs.org.au.